Great seeing all of you guys in the house on this uh, 4th of July weekend. Turn to your neighbor to your left. Tell them, welcome home. Turn to your other neighbor and also welcome them home as well. And then let's make some noise for Jesus. Let's go. Make some noise for Jesus. Yeah, we're going to have fun tonight. And this is going to be a really amazing series. You know, we're... Uh, you know, coming into a day and age where, like we talked about in the last series, we are emerging out of this pandemic. We are emerging out of the season that we've been in. And there are great things that God has planned, that he has in store for us as a church, as individuals to experience and encounter. Not just for our lives, but for the lives of people that we've been believing for and praying for. I know some of us, like we came to service and we're like, man, we didn't have to like RSVP. Like we didn't have to come in. We didn't need to check in. We didn't need to have like reservations at the 6 and the 745 service. Like changes are coming. But this is something I want to leave for all of us before we dive into God's word. Is that is just an insignificant little change when you compare it to the greatness that God wants to bring us through in the season that we are entering in. Coming out of this pandemic isn't so that we go back to convenience and go back to how things were and just the convenience of not having to check into a service. God has prepared in us prayers, things of faith that we're believing for that he wants us to experience and encounter firsthand. That's what we're entering into. And I truly believe, I truly believe, and I think that's, this is for many of us too, that some of the greatest days that we will ever witness on this side of eternity is because of what we've been through and what God wants to use in and through us in this upcoming season for others as well. I'm telling you that. This is a prophetic time. This is a great moment, a great opportunity for God's people to rise up. So in this series, we're going to be talking about what it is to serve in the church. We're going to be talking about that tonight. Next week, we're going to be talking about what it is to serve at home. And then after that, we're going to be talking about what it looks like to serve out there in the community. And I know some of us are like, man, like a series about serving like, what is significant about that, right? A series like that, like, that's, like, how? How does that connect into my relationship with God? How does that make me a better Christ follower, being trained and equipped by God's word and his spirit and his truth to be an excellent server for his glory and for his kingdom? Like, how, why, when, who, right? Many of you guys are Gen Z. Many of you guys are on the younger end of the spectrum. We live in a culture and a society today that is based off of what you can build for yourself, your namesake, your notoriety, your tweets, your followers, your responses of what people think about you and say about you. We want to build our lives in such a way where we have a kingdom to ourself. But here's the crazy thing about God. Here's the crazy thing about Jesus. Is God himself created a kingdom and it wasn't just for him. It was for all of us to experience his love in real and genuine and authentic ways, personal ways which is why he sent his son Jesus for all of us. Which is why when we talk about serving, it actually reveals to us how much Jesus loves us because he is a king of kings and a Lord of lords, yet at the same time he came from heaven to see us face to face in our brokenness and our depravity and he accepts us and he loves us and he says, son and daughter, I have called you to greatness. Now go in faith. You know, one thing I know about Gen Z that I've been reading up on all of this is a lot of people count off the young, younger generation and then just say they're all about themselves. You know what statistics say after the Gen Z demographic has been interviewed? Asking, what would it mean to live a life of significance? You know how Gen Z has responded? To make a difference in the world. There is no greater difference that you can have in your day and age, in your life here on earth, than allowing somebody to encounter the presence of God through your life and inviting people into the greatest story of redemption we will ever see and witness. And he came to earth for us. That is King Jesus. He came as a servant. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you want to learn how to be more like Jesus, if you want to be able to exemplify Jesus more and more and more in your working place, your campuses, with your family, with your siblings, with your friends, get to know more about serving. Because through serving, Jesus changed history. 
and he's calling us to be part of his history-making purposes. Amen? With that said, can we open up in prayer? Lord, we invite your spirit and we invite your presence here. God, we know that you are good and you are good in so many ways. So whatever it is that your word says, it actually calls us deeper into your goodness. And as we talk about serving tonight specifically in the context of church, Lord, I pray that you will illuminate new things to every single one of us and that through your son, Jesus, we would learn and grow and be more of the kingdom impacting generation that you have destined us to be here on earth. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who shows us the perfect example of servant leadership. And may that, Lord Jesus, give us a compass in how we're supposed to react and respond because a harvest is coming. Family members, friends, co-workers, and classmates are gonna come to know you in this season. Help us, Lord God, to be part of the journey of helping them encounter you through us. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, God is good. Turn to your other neighbor and tell them all the time. And then when you're done, you can look up on screen because point one is up there. It goes like this. Jesus exemplified a true heart of serving. Jesus exemplified a true heart of serving. And again, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God himself. Yet again, he came to this earth to serve and to save every single one of us from eternal separation from God through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection. We're going to read a little bit more out of Mark 10 in a little bit, but I want to set up the story, and we're going to talk about the disciples specifically, okay? And what we see in the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, is Jesus begins to gather his 12 disciples, his believers, and they begin to follow him and witness him, and they learn from him, and they grow with him, and he teaches them what it is to truly have a heart after God. And they think that he's just like caring and loving him or loving them, but he's actually preparing them. He is preparing his disciples to carry on the kingdom work and the good works that they were called to complete when he ascends into heaven. And through all of the relationship that they had with Jesus, like he was able to like really build with them, but he was also able to witness and see the humanity of his disciples, which meant that they weren't perfect people. The disciples had like their own issues. This is like 2,000 years ago, but they had issues. 2,000 years later, we all have issues, right? Turn to your neighbor, tell them, you have issues. And turn to your other neighbor and say, but God has redeemed me. And that is the story of redemption, everybody, because the story of redemption through Jesus Christ comes through our brokenness. Because we've hit that point where we realize like we can't do any more on our own. And the only reasonable response to the free gift of salvation that Jesus provides us is to have relationship with him. These disciples had to count the cost of following Jesus and they began to do that. So they're following Jesus, they're watching him perform miracle signs and wonders, teaching them, equipping them, talking story with them. Jesus was the best storyteller. Read the New Testament, you'll see it for yourself. But again, in these moments, Jesus gets like a glimpse of their heart, glimpse of their soul. And there's these two um, disciples, James and John, they're brothers, right? And again, it's starting to hit them. Like, dude, like, this is actually the Messiah. Like, he just rose someone from the dead. He just healed the blind. Like, he just showed compassion to somebody that was outcasted in society. This is the Son of God. He is the Messiah that the Old Testament prophecy said would one day come and save God's chosen people once and for all. This is the guy. So here's the thing. The disciples, being fallen and broken, they respond to the reality of who Jesus is with this. They wanted shotgun in Jesus's car. And James and John go up to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, yeah, we're brothers, okay? So like we're in this together, but we left the other 10 disciples. And we want to ask you, when you conquer sin and death and you save humanity, can we sit on the left and right of your glory? Just the two of us, not the rest of the disciples, not the rest of the people that you're going to save, just the two of us. We all have like those friends, yeah, that always want shotgun when someone like drives. Like, isn't that like so annoying? Like, why do you always get shotgun? Like, why do you just always go to the, it's just because you said shotgun, you're entitled to the shotgun, like, seat, right? How do you feel about those people? Some of you guys are already thinking of people, and you're like, man, like, that was my friend when we came here. They called shotgun. There's this entitlement that we have, right? And God, in his loving truth, has a moment with his disciples, and he's like, 
Let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about that heart motive of wanting to sit at the right and left of my glory. Like, let me actually tell you about who I am and what it truly, truly means to sit in the glory of God. These are just like the two brothers. The other 10 disciples found out. And they're like, dude, like these guys are like trying to like make moves with Jesus to have more authority and more like opportunity with Jesus the Messiah. And they started all getting mad and angry. And like what Jesus does, again, he knows that they're fallen and broken, but these are his disciples that he is preparing to change the world with the gospel. So he gathers them all in. James, John, Peter, Mark, all y'all, come, let me teach you. God's word teaches us how we're supposed to live. That's fact. It's truth. And this is what Jesus speaks to his disciples who are now trying to make moves with power and authority This is what Jesus says. Mark 10, 43 to 45. Whoever wants to become great among you must first be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Show of hands. You don't need to be like shy. How many of you guys here want to be great in your life? Some of us want to be mediocre. That's okay. Okay. We're in church. You can put your hands down. God, through Jesus, is saying, I have called you to be great. My disciples, my friends, I have called you to be great. But then he juxtaposes this particular situation with James and John saying that if you want to be great, it's not about sitting to the left or, my, or to the right. It's about having a servant's heart because I came to this earth to serve, not be served. And if you're going to change the world when I ascend into heaven, then that servant heart has to be your heart. And he takes this moment, which we have moments. I'm going to just, just have bad days. We're trying to walk with God and do the right thing, and we just have like a bad day. And again, Jesus just welcomes us in. Hey, you want to be great? Learn to serve. And if you learn to serve, you'll actually learn more about me. And if you learn about me, you'll actually learn more how to serve. You know, there's a lot of dreams here. Like many of us, we want to be entrepreneurs. You want to start new like gadgets or things, right? A lot of us want to be great teachers and we want to be great doctors or we want to be great engineers or we want to be just great People, great mothers, great fathers, great husbands, great wives, great baristas, if you like Starbucks, you know, and coffee bean. We want to be great. But the world says be great by attaining notoriety and status and being at the right hand of great leaders and messiahs and kings. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. You want to be great, learn to serve. That's who I am. And that's who I've called you to be. And when I'm no longer here on earth, then you guys are going to have to share the gospel and make disciples with a nation and people who are going to ridicule you and persecute you. You're actually going to need one another. So all this fighting that you guys are having because James and John had a moment. No, that's not how it works. We're going to love and we're going to serve. Amen? A lot of people like to ask me like, well, why did you go into full-time ministry? Why are you a pastor? And my initial response to everybody that asked, which maybe not, may not be the best response, was like, I never wanted to be. You know, I never wanted to, like, if, again, if you guys get to know me, I'm highly introverted. I'm very quiet. Like, I don't like public speaking. I don't like getting in front of large crowds. And you're like, dude, this guy's lying. Like, no, it's true. Like, absolutely 100%. Like, I am an introvert, like, hardcore introvert, okay? And when I first started coming to church, 16 years ago, when I was a freshman in high school, I began to witness a community of people that I have never witnessed before in my life. I love my parents, but I grew up in a broken home and a dysfunctional home. I didn't know what functioning looked like, okay? And I would come to church, and because my, my friend invited me, I'm like, dude, these are like really happy people. They're on something. That's how I thought. And the more and more and more and more that I began to come and they would continue to invite me and welcome me and love on me, I just started to realize like, dude, like these people like legitimately love God and these people legitimately love me. 
And I was just like, they're doing everything here at service, the parking, the greeting, the ushering, the sound team, the multimedia team, the worship team, the greeting team, the ushering team. I probably said it more than once, but it's a lot of teams here at church. And they're doing all of these things so that I can sit in a seat and encounter God through worship and the word and the people of God. They are literally just doing this for me. And then I was like, I could get part of that. I'd like to step into what that looks like because I would hear about serving and how that's good for you and how it's important in your walk with God. So I did. And one of the very, very first things, again, thinking back to what started it all for me, like kind of in this whole journey of faith and stuff, it was serving. And what I used to do Friday nights before our youth services at Momilani Elementary was me and a group of friends, we would go to the church office, which was right down the street at the time above Midas, and we would stuff bulletins. As a freshman in high school, trying to make a name for myself, nothing more cool than stuffing a bulletin before church on a Friday. That's how it started. And then after doing that, we would drive up to church. And then I was also in charge of like overseeing like the chairs and putting all of the chairs at youth service in place. Like to this very day, I'm OCD with chairs. Like you can even ask Ikaya, right? We met this past week in Enolite, one of our rooms on this side. And as he came in, I was like fixing chairs. Like I was putting chairs in place. And he's like, you need help? What are you doing? I'm like, I'm just fixing chairs. Like because chairs need to be fixed, right? That's what I did. And then like I would pass out the bulletins like with our greeting team. And then after that was done, I would break down the chairs. But there was something about those moments of serving other people and witnessing from the back other people worshiping God and encountering God and being moved by God that I was like, I'm actually in the right place. This is exactly what I'm called to do. And for many of us in the seasons that we're in as students, we get so bored And we get over like the season that we're in. But God is saying, if you haven't learned how to be a servant student and a servant son and a servant sibling, how in the world can you change the world? Serving, the heart of serving is such a Jesus thing, so counterculture. But it is so life-giving and life-transforming. So if anybody wants to know why I even stepped into this whole thing about going into full-time ministry, It was just because I was obedient to serving others. And when you go into your careers that God has called you to be, because not everyone's called to be a pastor, and that's great because you can be a pastor out there in the marketplace, out there in the community, out there on campus. But with the heart and the motive to serve, God's going to do great things in and through your life. And you're going to be looking back 16 years later, and you'll know it came when you first said yes to serving God with the right hearts and motives. A lot of times, right, we want serving to have notoriety, feel, like, accepted. Like, I used to get angry that no one thanked me for, like, stuffing bulletins, passing out bulletins, setting up the chairs, and breaking down the chairs. Like, there was a few times I kicked chairs. I did it, like, on the back of Momilani, pack, like, man, like, no one appreciated me. What kind of motive is that? You know, like, no, people got saved, but I'm mad that they didn't thank me for setting up a chair for them to get saved. Like, that's not right. That's not cool. That's why James and John and the rest of the disciples had a moment with Jesus because he was course correcting something in their soul that just wasn't right. Serving is about what we can give to other people because we've received everything in Jesus Christ. You have nothing to earn when you serve. You have everything to give because Jesus served you. Amen? Number two in your notes. Serving reveals God's love for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I wanna say one thing before we move on. The gospel, when you get to know exactly what it's about, is very, very scandalous. You have the son of God, right? Up in heaven. And you have a fallen and broken world here. And because of sin, we shouldn't have relationship with God for eternity. We're actually supposed to be separated for eternity from God. And God could have like stepped back and said like, dude, like I created all of this for you and I am God and you messed it up. So I'm done with you guys. I'm going to go create my own another world or other universe or whatever the case is. But because God so loved the world, he sent his son Jesus. Because he so loved the world that he would meet us sinful and broken people. And he would lift us up into the greatest days. He would lift us up into our purpose and destiny. He would lift us up into moments where we are just so amazed by how good God is. 
And the beauty about being part of a church family is we can actually do that with one another together for other people. And in a world and a community and maybe even families and households where all we've seen is disunity, when the church can come together to do something for other people, it gives people hope that that church and those Christians and those believers aren't just bad, judgmental, critical people, but they're actually quite loving. And there's just something so different when I come to church. You guys are exactly where you need to be. God, I don't know, like should he have sent his son Jesus to live the life we should have lived and die the death that we deserve? Like I'm not God, so I can't make that call, but I am so thankful he did. I am so thankful that I get to live in freedom and victory and have hope every single day. And that's the story for many of us here. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit or are we going to sit in our 22-inch seats and just be comfortable, fart during service and not tell anybody and then just kind of carry on our way? Or are we going to rise up to the occasion and say, yo, these seats in this house, they're for people. They're for my family. They're for my friends. They're for my coworkers. They're for my classmates. They're for my friends who are broken and are on the brink of extinction. That's for them. You know how I know that? Because someone did all of this for us. Someone did all of this. People have done all of this tonight for you who are sitting in the chairs right now, hopefully encountering God in a real authentic way. God's love is supposed to be exemplified by God's people. And we know that by him first exemplifying his love for us through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You know, one of the last moments that Jesus had with his disciples before he was going, going to be crucified and before he was going to be wrongfully judged, crucified, and then killed, was he was actually with his disciples and again, throughout his time with his disciples, he was constantly teaching and preaching them, giving them examples and parables and stories and illustrations and, and even correction in truth and grace and love, right, to his disciples about what it truly meant to be, you know, servants. And now he is actually telling his disciples in the Gospels and specifically out of the book of Luke that he is just saying like, hey, I'm, I'm about to die. Like, I am about to be persecuted. I am about to be wrongfully accused. I am about to be sentenced to death. I am about to die. And you kind of think like, okay, this is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Like he could change things in an instant. Like he could make everything turn around for his good and for his glory like that because he's God. But he's telling them, this is it. Like this is the moment that we've been preparing, or one of the moments that we've been preparing for. And again, he gathers them in. He pulls his disciples in, and then he has a moment with them. Another moment to show that this King Jesus, first and foremost, is servant Jesus to his friends, to sinful, broken people that Jesus sees as his friends. Pulls them in, and he begins to wash their feet. Now do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor. Look at their feet. Look at it intently. If they're wearing shoes, imagine what their shoe is hiding on the inside. Might be some crooked nails. Might be some dirt in the side of the toe. Might be some dry skin, right? Yeah, you guys are like, dude, Jesus really was a champ, man. He really was a champ. Would you wash the feet of the person sitting next to you because they're your friend. You're lying, Ronson. I heard you. I'm no, just joking. Oh, because you get the heart of Jesus, right? We're going there. We're getting there. Just participate where we're going right now, though. Right? Love you, Ronson. But you get what I'm saying? He begins to wipe the feet of his disciples, his friends. And here's why that's gross, okay? Because back then, they didn't have, like, shoes, Okay? They didn't have roads. They didn't have grass. There was a lot of poop everywhere and dirt. So as the disciples are going about their business, following Jesus, they're walking in all of these things, and their feet were nasty. Okay, Everyone's foot was nasty, not just the feet. People had more than one foot, right? Like, they all had dirty feet. So culturally, if you were, like, having guests over, it was actually culturally necessary, 
and also just a sign of goodwill that you would begin to wash the feet or you or like a servant would wash the feet of your guests and you would welcome them into, the, into your home. Again, juxtapose this with Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who is now about to be crucified in one of the last moments with his disciples is he has a powerful moment where he is washing their feet. Why? Because he came to serve. Why? Because he's setting an example of what it looks like for the people of God to serve others. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And I'm going to read us from John 13, um, 12 to 17. It's going to pick up a little bit in this story. So when Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And what is the blessed thing? What is the blessed thing that Jesus is trying to get across to his people? Are we supposed to like wash everyone's foot that we come in contact with? No, we're just supposed to serve them the same way Jesus served us. We're supposed to love them the same way that Jesus loved us. You know what's powerful about him or like the analogy of him washing people's feet? That's actually what he does to our soul. He washes our soul of the dirt and the muck and the mire. And when we witness a clean heart and a clean life and a transformed heart and a transformed life, how could we not want to do that for other people? And here's like the thing, like Jesus isn't asking us for like to die on the cross. He's not asking us to like pay the penalty of all sin for all of humanity. He's actually not even asking us, at least not in this context, to wash people's feet. Here's my question for all of us. Would you help someone walk to their chair? Would you greet someone in the parking lot with a smile? When someone is asking for the restroom and you're an usher, can you stop the task that you need to do and help someone find the bathroom because they need to pee? If you're in sound and multimedia, do you see that as an opportunity for people to encounter God's word and God's spirit and truth on screen and have a moment in their chairs that got you up there when you said yes to serving? All Jesus is asking us is have the same spirit as I do. Have the same heart and motives as I do. Because if we can't do it as a church and you can't serve one another that's sitting next to you, how are we going to serve the world? How are you going to do it when I'm gone? This is Jesus putting a seal of approval. True leadership, true influence. You want to make a difference? It starts with serving and being a little bit a little bit more like Jesus each step of the way. And I know a lot of people here do serve, so thank you guys so much for serving. We love you guys. You guys are awesome and amazing. But for many of us that don't, or perhaps we haven't taken that step into serving, like, man, like, there are so many places in our church to use your gifts and talents for the glory of kingdom and God. A lot of places where you can just do this. This is what got started for me, like this. You want a bulletin? Take a bulletin. You want a bulletin? Take a bulletin. Hi, welcome to church. Have a good service. You know, like, just... Passing out bulletins. If you can do that, God can use you. And if you can do that here in the church, you can do that out there on the campuses with your family, with your friends. We don't a lot of times know what it's like to serve other people with the right heart. You learn it here so we can do it out there. Amen? Amen. You know, I know like 4th of July weekend, we want to have more of like a celebratory kind of message, you know, like laugh and all of that kind of stuff. But sometimes the challenging messages are the best. It's just who Jesus is. We'll have popsicles and hamburgers after service is done. But I got you right now, so we're going to get into God's word. Amen? Amen. Number three in your notes as we bring things to a close tonight. Serving enlarges our heart for others. And here's a key one. John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Again, John 13, 34 to 35. Throughout my time here in the church, but definitely over the last year and a half, what I just love hearing 
is when people come in for the first time to our church, or maybe they've been, you know, not in church for a while, not at our church for a while, and they've kind of been missing, or, you know, life happens, things happen. But over the last year and a half, a lot of people have come to church. I know tonight, you know, we may not see a whole lot of people here physically, um, partly, obviously, because of the 4th of July, July weekend, but throughout the last season in this pandemic, so many people have come into relationship with Jesus. Family members, friends, coworkers, and classmates, loved ones, people that we've been praying for and believing for. And what I appreciate so much is when they come into our church and like you talk to them, you engage them, you, you know, like, oh, how do you like service? You know, that's like one of the questions you always ask a new person, like, how do you like service? And more often than not, the people that have been asked, either by me or other people, is just like, man, I, love, I loved it. Like, I don't know what it is about it. Like, some people don't even have a church background, and they just come, and they're like, there's just something so real, so authentic, so honest, so genuine. Like, I don't really get the worship thing. I don't know why I need to lift up my hands. Like, the preacher's really, like, passionate, but he's kind of crazy at times, too, because he's loud. What's up with that? But I'm down to come again. There's just something real at there's something real here. I want to paint a picture for all of us. Service doesn't start at 7.45. At least not Sunday night. On a Sunday night, service starts at 4 p.m. when the first person, our serve team overseer, comes in, opens the door, and allows our serve teams to come through. We're talking about our worship team. We're talking about sound and multimedia. We're talking about the ushers and the greeters, the parking team, the shuttles team, like the kids' church team for the 6 o'clock service, the next-gen ministries. Service starts at 4 p.m., and a lot of times we think it's 7.45 when the worship team begins the worship song, right? And we're still, like, in the lobby talking when we should be inside, but we're outside. Come inside on time. Worship's great, right? But service, yeah, 4 p.m. And you know why? All of these people go out of their way so that other people like us can sit in service. It's because they themselves have radically experienced the love of God in such a transformative way that they would say yes to coming three hours ahead of time to honor and praise God, not in seats, but with their hands, with their feet, and with the different ministry areas that they oversee. So that you... And the people that you invite, your family members and your friends, our loved ones, those that we've been praying for and believing for, can come to a seat, sit down in our comfy chair, and like an orchestra and a symphony of teams serving together, they could hear the voice, the spirit, the truth, and the love of God in the most beautiful sound that their soul has been craving for this whole time. That's when service starts. And this service, this church, it exists for the very moments that we do all of this for one person to come to know Jesus. So before we go, you know, close out tonight, can we do this? Can we just give a hand to all of our different serve teams? Come on. And I want to leave this with all of us too. Like when you come, and I know we want to talk to our friends and you know, we want to, you know, just be here. But in still and small moments, like, take a look. Take a look at the faces. Take a look at the people. Take a look at the ones that have gone above and beyond. They're doing it for you. And as we enter a season where our family and friends, the harvest is going to come and so many lives are going to be changed, we're actually preparing it for them but we're also in need right now for all of us to come and say yes, that we want to be part of someone's journey to encounter God. You know how God knows or how we know that God wants this message to be preached? We've got fireworks happening right now. This is a celebra celebratory thing, talking about serving. I mean, it's really what the 4th of July is about, right? But we're going to park here a little bit. Are we ready? because some great things are coming and happening. We're going to be part of that journey, amen? Jesus talked to his disciples, and he handled all of their issues with so much grace and truth. And at the end of the day, all he asked was for them to serve and to love and to be all that they could be 
for the sake of one more life, saying yes to Jesus in their lifetime. And the disciples worked together. They weren't perfect. They weren't Jesus, but they worked together.